Oh, and uh, I, I was telling him earlier, I made friends with the the head chef at the the uh, the hotel I was at. And um, I mean, this is like a nice hotel for, for business people. So non-Indian folks coming in that they want to keep a, away from the India, <laughs> the real India or something like that. And he took me to church on Sunday and we went to the, the biggest church in the world. It's, uh, it, you know, it's what we would call here one of the mega churches, you know, so they're selling books and stuff from the, you know, so I'm not sure I have a, a high opinion of those anyways, but 190,000 active members. And on Sundays, they have five services and each service has 20,000 people that come. 20,000 people. Yeah, as a Christian church, but I'm thinking some somewhere in the non-denominational zone. Um, and so we went to the first service, which was all in Telugu. And since I'm fluent in Telugu, I understood none of the words. So, <laughs> so it was uh, it was an interesting uh, experience. But just to be at you know a church that's that big, you know, they have people directing traffic and. You know, and you, you don't you don't wear your shoes in there, so you have to check your your shoes in. So they're checking shoes in for twenty thousand people, right? And they give you this little like rusty coin. <laughs> like, Bring this back, and we'll find your shoes. So, uh, but my shoes did kind of stand out. The average Indian isn't all that big of a person, so it's. I think they had to put my shoes in two separate cubbies <laughs> or something like that. Okay. It on my desktop here. Oh, I need to unzip this. All right, well, that's cooking. I'm going to come back in here. All right, so terrain's not too bad. Just, you know, the, you were able to kind of, I think he gave you a terrain, but he kind of showed you how they work, where you can kind of pull up things to give mountains and, and stuff like that. So probably an artistic -y type of skill to make good terrains, but not very hard to make a terrain. Okay. Um, so let's look at moving the player. I'm going to kind of fast forward to uh, some of the code things. I want to talk about um, some of the stuff in there. Uh, for starters, tell me about raycasts. I'm going to open up the, uh, the lecture here. What What is a raycast? Cast array from where you point to the okay. So what's a ray? What What, what is it used for? Okay, so laser pointer, right? Okay, so what we can do is if I want to cast a ray to that back wall, it's a laser pointer that goes to that back wall and it has collisions associated with it, right? So I can know when I've hit something. So if I want to have a pointer and I want to point to one of those pictures on the back wall, I can have my ray cast, I can cast a ray and tell it, let me know when it collides with something. And if it collides with something of, you know, tagged picture or something like that, I can then make some decisions based on it, right? Now, in this game, they had to do something a little bit weird because they had to do some mathy stuff because what you were actually doing is, um, I think for this one, oh, well, they used, they used Raycast in this one, didn't they? Yeah. But we were, oh, we were clicking on the, uh, so we were clicking on a place on the screen, right? And the screen is a 2D canvas in terms of what we're, we're, we're looking, right? So then they cast a ray from there into 3D space to see, figure out where did you actually click on the terrain, right? That's how they, that's how they accomplished it. All right, so they had to do this weird mapping thing based on where you clicked on the screen, cast a ray through that to find out when do you actually hit th you know, terrain or something to find the point on the screen, the point in the, on the terrain where you actually wanted your dude to, uh, to run. I think that's really funny how it always says, oh, don't forget me. Um, and then... Uh,
after I haven't used it for like a week, it wants me to re-authenticate the thing. Yes, let's trust it again. Maybe there was a software update or something on Windows and it's a new browser thingy. All right, so let's get this in our notes. All right, well, and by the way, we'll talk about it on um, Tuesday after break because we don't actually have class Thursday, right? Break starts, so I'm back. I'm gone for two weeks, come back, teach one day, and on break. Um, but uh, so we'll talk about it on Tuesday, but we'll have our um, midterm on Thursday, a week from this coming Thursday. So uh, just the general thing for those of you who had my test before, it's uh, uh, usually 10 questions, 10 points a piece. Um, there'll be uh, some coding, a lot of reading code. I probably won't have you write a lot of C-sharp on the test, um, but you know, I might ask you to explain how you might accomplish something. I might show you some code and say, what does this do? That type of stuff. Um, and remember in my classes, if you do better on the final than you did on the midterm, you can replace your score in the midterm with whatever you got on the final. So a poor midterm grade isn't necessarily killer. Um, but we'll talk about the actual topics you need to focus on, um, on Tuesday, but basically go through the slides and it's going to, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to kind of go through the slides beginning of class and tell you what looks important to me and what doesn't, because that's what I'm going to write and put on the exam. All right, so we're going to say a ray cast is an invisible line cast from a point in a direction that has the capability of collision with other colliders. Okay, so this can be used in a whole bunch of stuff. So, for instance, like in, uh, it's pretty commonly used in like VR. You know, so you have your hand controller here, and we'll cast a ray out of the front of it for when you want to select stuff on a menu. Otherwise, you have to walk up and kind of slap slap the menu or something like that. So, for controls and stuff in VR, it's a pretty common thing, and you can just imagine that it's used in a lot of other things as well. Okay. So that's terrain, some materials. So let's go to moving the player. Um, and I want to get to the part where they talk about ray cast. Realistically, let me see if I can. I'm actually going to open up the whole project. Um, well, actually, we can go back and talk about the character controller a little bit, too. In fact, let's just look at that contents. Well, here, I can talk about this at the high level here. Um, so uh, as opposed to our first project, when we used the Gollum one, um, where, you know, we just had a, uh, a rigid body 
uh, with a collider attached to it. And we put all sorts of constraints on the rigid body so he didn't fall over and things like that. And then all we did is we used the arrow keys for moving him left and right. We just added velocity to the rigid body, right? That's how we dealt with our entire player. So we kind of, you know, did a very simplified uh, character. Now, if we think about Unity as a game engine, and it's probably de developed to write video games, it likely has something built into it for uh, handling player-based stuff, right? Okay, so this is something called our character controller. It gives us a lot of built-in stuff for um, doing player-related uh, things. So, you know, they're talking about movement and, and things like that, as well as collisions. And just a second ago, he was talking about collision flags. Um, what is a collision flag? What are they used for? Okay. Um, but it gets a it's a little bit more in-depth than that. So we've done colliders before, right? So we've, we've done colliders that uh, really say whether we collided or didn't collide. What are the collision flags actually used for as it relates to the character controller? It's still collisions, but it really gives us kind of a granular control over where did we collide. Because we might care, right? We might care whether something hit us in the area near the hand or, or something like that or whether it was colliding by our feet that kind of stuff we might care about that type of stuff so let's get this into our notes so we have um character controller so this is a um built in object for handling many of the movement and collision related things associated with a player in a game. Something along those lines. Okay. All right, so notice here when we look at the properties of our character controller. Um, now, one thing to kind of consider, and this is more of a, a broader computer science thing, this word controller here um, is commonly used throughout technology. So, for instance, if you're into like electronics or something like that, you might have a controller board where you have a, you know, maybe a programmable microcontroller. A lot of times they're called microcontrollers that you might connect into a whole bunch of servos and robot parts and stuff like that. You program this guy and he's the guy that actually controls firing a signal here or firing a signal there. So, you know, you do all your talking through the controller and then the controller can deal with the other pieces. That makes sense. Okay, so this guy, they didn't just come up with his name willy-nilly, this idea of a controller. Well, it makes a lot of sense, right? We, you play Xbox, you play this PlayStation, your means of interacting is through a controller, okay? And you have to do stuff in terms of what that controller provides. So you might wish there was an extra button or something like that on your controller sometimes, but in general, or you wish the button was in a different place because your hands are too big, but, you know, in general you learn the controller and you become confident with the controller and that's how you have to inter interact with the game. All right, so a couple of the, uh, the properties we have here that we're really gonna care about, let's say, is you might care about where the center of your actual guy is, so kind of his core. Uh, that might be something you do some math and things off of. Uh, the collision flags was something he was just talking about. This is what part of the capsule collided with the environment uh, during the last move call. All right, so if I click on that, we can ask things like, where did we actually hit? So if controller.collision flags, that means if we collided with something, and we collided with something above us. So maybe you're trying to look at collisions related to a roof or something like that. Um, then you could do things like touch the ceiling, that kind of stuff. So this kind of comes down to the idea of having more granular control over um, what did we hit. Let me just click on collision flags here. Hopefully it gives me the description of the various Okay, so we have um, collision with none. All right. 
Uh, so this guy, instead of asking whether collision flags were set, he's just saying, we're going to talk about the controller's collision flags. If we're colliding with nothing, collision flags none will be set. Otherwise, we might be colliding with the sides. Now, notice that, uh, well, let's see how they're doing this. Okay, so here's, this is an interesting thing. What is this operator? Hmm? This guy right here, Amp single ampersand. Bitwise. Yeah, it's bitwise. So this is a bitwise ant. Okay, so this comes down to something called masking. Uh, so let's get that into our notes here. And this is really, I'm going to kind of talk about it at the high level, but I'm not going to ask you about it at the detail level in this course. It's something we will talk about in the 325 course um, when we're dealing with, uh, well, here, let me just kind of talk about it here. So this idea of masking is commonly used in various aspects of computer science. We're seeing it here in game programming, and we're seeing it kind of in, a, in the really common use. We have a whole bunch of different states that something can be in. All right, and we want to know whether or not a state is individual or whether we have one state combined with other states. Okay, and when we think about that, like what we're really asking is if it's this and it's this and it's this. So if we're colliding with the sides and we're colliding with the top and we're colliding with something else, we want to know that. But the way that the flags are represented is with a number. Okay, and ultimately inside of computers, numbers are represented as binary strings. Right. OK, so, you know, a bunch of zeros and ones. So if we want to know, are we hitting the sides and are we hitting something else? We take those two flags, which are binary strings, and we and them together on a per bit basis, giving us a new binary string. So like a one and a one is a one, a one and a zero is a zero, a zero and a one is a zero, a zero and a zero is a zero. So the only time an and would produce a one is when they're both flag, both of those bits are on. Does that make sense? So ultimately, when we take these two values and we mask them together to get with an and and give us this new value, this value would have a unique state if both of these were on. And it would have a unique state if only one of them was on. Does that kind of make sense? So this allows us to determine unique states among multiple states where a state is represented as a binary string, binary number, however you want to think about it. And then I'm going to throw this. This is typically handled through bitwise ants, which is a single ampersand in Java and C Sharp, C, C++. So when you see a single ampersand, that's a bitwise and. A double ampersand, which is what we commonly will see, is a normal and. Is this Boolean expression and this Boolean expression, are they both true? That's what we commonly see. So this is more of a magic math type thing that's happening under the hood for how can we uh, deal with two things. Not overly important for what's happening under the hood for us in here, but it is important for us to be able to say, ah, uh, this is what's happening. I want to know if this state and this state happen to both be firing at the same time. And I do that with a bitwise and in the middle. You can even say as a game programmer, I don't know why, that's just how it's done. Make some sense? All right, so notice here in their example, they're saying, I want to take all my collision flags, right? I want to take every single one of my collision flags, and I'm going to, so this is, this is going to be like a, a already fully masked value with all the different things already ended together. And I'm going to take those, and I'm going to end it with my specific flag I'm interested in. All right. And if what it produces, remember, it's going to produce a binary string, but that binary string ultimately represents a number. 
right? If it ultimately produces something that's not a zero, that means I'm touching the sides. Make sense? So this is a way for them. Otherwise, you can say, um, am I colliding with the sides? So notice the, the difference here. So this is saying this next one down. If I take the controller flags, if the controller flags are exactly equal to the sides, that means I'm only touching the sides. Whereas this one's saying, if I take all the controller flags, this is the fully masked version of all the places that I'm touching. And I end that with the version of you know, the binary string that's associated with just touching the sides. And it gives me something that's not a zero. Then I know that this particular flag was part of what produced this fully masked value. It's a member of that fully max value. So it's almost like me extracting that. So my col uh, controller.collision flag is just going to be some binary number that happened to be produced by having all these other flags ended together. Make sense? Um, actually, it was probably produced by having them ordered together. Um, that's a 325 thing. Don't worry about it in here. But fully masked. <laughs> okay, so we have a single number that says, here's all the stuff that's happened. And then we're going to end that with just the thing that represents that we're colliding with the sides. And this really is asking, is this, was this particular binary string part of what made this masked binary string? And we know it is if we end it bitwise and, and it gives us something other than zero. Realistically, it would give us a one. Does that make some sense? Okay, so that allows us to say, are we, we might be doing other things, but is one of the things we're doing touching the sides? As opposed to this one saying, is our fully masked controller flags exactly identical to what colliding with the sides is? That means that's all we're doing. We're colliding with the sides. Make sense? Okay. And you see they use the exact same pattern here for... Uh, are we touching the ceiling among whatever else is happening? Um, so sometimes might, we might care whether something is the only thing happening. Sometimes we might want to know whether among everything we're touching the ceiling or we're touching the sides or touching, you know, whatever. Okay. So kind of makes sense what this uh, collision flag stuff is used for. It allows us to be much more granular about um, what part of the world we might be hitting. That might be something that's important in our game. It might not be, okay? But one of the things that the character controller has built into it is the ability to do that. All right. All right, so this guy's probably going to be a Boolean, I'm guessing. Yeah, so this just turns on or off whether or not you want to detect collisions for this guy. You might decide that you want a character controller specifically for the purpose of movement, and you don't really care if he's hitting stuff. So you can just turn off detect collisions, and that will give you a performance boost, right? Because now you're not having to do all this, um, you know, you're not asking the system to constantly pay attention um, where you're colliding and, and or if you're colliding, that kind of stuff. Um, height, this might be, you know, somewhat important when you try to determine whether or not you should fit in a space, something like that. Just keep in mind, there's always going to be, um, you know, this is more of a, uh, you know, visual perception versus reality thing. You might have a character that technically will fit in something because of where he's colliding with the terrain or something like that is from a human eye perspective, we see that his head's actually in the wall. You know, you've probably seen that in games before where, you know, somebody like, look, he's hitting that wall and but he's still be able to move through there. So collisions might occur at a pixel that as a human we can see is actually inside of the visual visual representation of something. But it uh, um, it isn't getting detected until his arm or his head or whatever it is is halfway into the wall. Um. 
is grounded. Uh, this is uh, kind of a quick way of, of asking whether his, uh, I'm guessing it's the, it's only asking whether the bottom um, was, was he touching. So you can accomplish the is grounded by asking the questions about the flags, whether uh, in the last thing um, you, and, you bitwise and it with uh, collision flags dot, I think it's bottom, collision flags dot bottom. And if that's true, is grounded, we return true. So this is just your quick way of saying, is, is the dude on the ground? Because we might imagine in a game, that's going to be a pretty common thing to wonder. Okay. Um, radius of his collision capsule. This would only be something for doing math stuff, you know, because typically we just care, did he hit something? So, you know, the notice here, it's talking about collision capsule. So we talked about different kinds of colliders before. So we can have a box collider. We have a sphere collider. So in this case, they're talking about a, uh, um, a capsule collider, which, you know, looks like a pill, right? <laughs> okay, so in that minus the arms kind of looks like a person, right? Um, now, I don't remember with this the, if they do two different uh, colliders. Well, at some point when I pop it up on the screen, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll point it out. But um, there are versions of character controllers, at least in other game engines, and I would be surprised if it's not here, where they actually represent the collider as almost look, what looks like a cross. So you have a capsule collider here, and then you have a separate, separate one that's his arms. Okay. Kind of the problem with doing it that way is you're kind of this walking stick figure. And in an animation, your arms are to the side here, yet your colliders are still up here. Okay, so sometimes what you need to do with that in mind is you need to have separate colliders, like maybe for the hands or the arms or something like that, if you want to have really, really granular control about him hitting a certain thing. Generally, in a video game, we're not, we're not looking for that level of granular control. If one pixel of your finger happened to hit something, that's maybe not that big of a deal, as opposed to having you know, full impact with other parts of the game. You know, because there's some sort of balance in there between performance and um, actual gameplay. And if you were literally detecting stuff at every pixel on his entire body, that might really hurt performance. Now, on the flip side, if you're doing something related to more of a simulation uh, based thing. So, you know, that's kind of maybe where we start uh, paying a lot more attention to something like that with like virtual reality, where we want to know exactly whether, you know, a certain finger hits something or something like that. Now that idea of having more colliders might be a lot more important and the cost of the performance of that might be worth it. All right. Something uh, like that. Anything else here that um, yeah, velocity of the character, that's going to be something that is going to be uh, when we actually tell a character controller to move. Now he's moving. He will have a velocity. We might be interested in asking about his velocity. OK, so notice he has a couple of public methods here. Again, we mentioned that a character controller's real purpose is to make it easy for your character to move. So we kind of have two versions um, of this guy. We have the complex move function. Um, which allows us to, uh, um, you know, it's calling moves along deltas. So these are going to be vector threes um, that we are saying we want to move from where we are now to that vector three go. And it's going to do a lot of math for calculating that movement. Whereas a simple move might allow us to just zip from one place to another, gaining some performance, depending on what we're trying to accomplish. Okay. Um, this message thing, we haven't uh, talked about these yet. I don't think he uses it in the game, right? Okay. So just in general, I'll just kind of highlight this um, for when we bump into it later on. Uh, what we can do is rather than, because at this point when we're checking for collisions, we're typically doing it inside of update, right? So we're saying, did he collide? 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 Over and over again. And we might imagine that adds up to performance issues, <laughs> possibly. Uh, although right now we're relying on our computers being very fast, right? What this uh, uh, message thing allows it to do is uh, we have this thing. Actually, I want to add it to the notes. Because even though we haven't used it yet, this is a pretty uh, important idea. Um, I'm just going to review something we uh, we talked. Did we talk about design patterns in here? Because so we talked about MVC, right? Okay, so I'm going to introduce another design pattern called the observer design pattern. 
All right. Um, anybody know what the observer design pattern says? So, Mo, go, go ahead. Probably kind of like a um, idea of a different class overlooking something and looking for those updates. Uh, it's like one's. Okay. Yeah, I mean, so so you're kind of given the technical, uh, like how it's actually implemented a little bit under the hood. So a lot of design patterns kind of think about how things work in real life. Okay. So the observer design pattern basically says it's a good idea to be productive while you're waiting for some event to occur. So let's just put this. It's a good idea to be productive while waiting for an event to occur and then be notified that the event occurred so that you can take action. All right, so you want to go back to, you know, elementary school or junior high or high school where, you know, you're productive in class and then the bell rings and when the bell rings, you get up and leave, right? So you're not sitting there. Well, some of you might be sitting there just watching the clock. <laughs> you're like, like, is it going to ring? Is it going to ring? Is it going to ring? So that's the update method, right? Um, but in general, you're in class, you're doing something, and you rely on the event of the bell ringing to let you know that it's now time to go do something else. Make sense? Okay, so that's what the observer design pattern says is, yeah, and keep in mind, the observer design pattern, design patterns in general, these guys are ideas, not implementations. We're at the we're we're reliant on an individual technology providing an implementation, or possibly not providing an implementation for something like this. Um, in fact, how many of you are familiar with um, a technology called Node.js? This has nothing to do really with game programming, or but it's more of a kind of a trivia thing related to this. All right, so, um, and I, I teach about this in all the programming classes, just this idea of comparative technologies, right? So, um, you know, you go through all your different programming languages, you got C, C++, Java, blah, blah, blah. Over on the web programming side, things get even, even um, more interesting because a lot of times what we do is we come up with really fancy names for really easy things, all right? And JavaScript, uh, have you heard of JavaScript before? Hey, what's JavaScript primarily used for? Development. Yeah, web stuff. OK, so uh, I'll throw in another uh, more trivia thing just to connect some dots. Uh, why is JavaScript? Why does JavaScript even exist? What's the what you say it's for web development? What aspect of web development is JavaScript for? Or was it primarily for logic? Logic where? Yeah, front end, front end. So really when we think about uh, um, web programming, we're thinking about the way that a user digests web programming is through, well, websites is through a web browser, right? Okay, and what's a, what is a web browser? A web browser is something that interprets HTML code, right? And uh, makes it, turns it into pretty pictures and text and stuff like that. So in the very early days of web pages, most web pages were mostly static. They didn't do anything but show data, right? So a web browser has two different capabilities. Okay. It has a little bit more now. Let me simplify it, though. But two different capabilities. It can take HTML and turn it into pretty pictures and text. Now, remind me, what's a programming language? What makes something a programming language? Using... The Lippmann perfect definition. Uh, no, because we have interpreted languages too. Like storage, memory. Yeah. How do you how do human beings solve problems? Memory, asking questions, repetition. Yes, yeah, so you're right. Okay. One hundred percent of programming languages have facilities for those three things. Okay. So if something for something to be a programming language, it it must have a way of probably creating variables, conditionals, asking questions. And then loops or functions, that kind of stuff. Okay, so we have to have those three things, you know, present in order to say something's a programming language. HTML, you know, so a little, an interesting thing is a lot, if somebody says, "Oh, well, but what what programming languages do you use?" If somebody says HTML, then they don't necessarily know what a programming language is. 
Okay. HTML is what I refer to as a data representation language. Still important, okay, but it's not a programming language. Can't create variables, can't ask questions, you can't write functions, not, doesn't have loops. It's, it's strictly for representing the information that a web page will contain in, in a, in a um, parsable format that the web browser can then piece it out and actually display it on the screen, right? But nowadays, and even in the early days in some situations, we require our websites to be a little bit more interactive than that, right? So we needed a programming language to complement HTML for doing uh, uh, front-end stuff in our web browser. So the most obvious use of JavaScript in a, uh, uh, on a web page is like form validation. If you put in your username and password and hit submit, a lot of times JavaScript is used to make sure you've put in a username and password at the very least before it sends it over the internet to the server. Because if you didn't give it both a username and password, the chances of you getting correctly authenticated are zero. So why waste network time? Why waste that time sending it to the server or waste cycle time on the server itself when you didn't even provide it enough information to authenticate? Make sense? Okay, so JavaScript might be used for front-end authentic authentication. So we're only using the uh, um, we're only using the CPU power of that person's personal computer to validate that thing, and they're the one using it right now. So who cares? Instead of having five million people all putting a burden on the central server for this. All right. So that's an example of where JavaScript could be used. Now, how many of you have heard of some other technologies? Like, how many of you have heard of AJAX? One and a quarter people. jQuery. Okay, heard of jQuery. Um, what's Ajax and jQuery? What are they for? Yeah, so they actually solved the same problem. So Ajax kind of came first. And so if you want to put this in context, you're watching the, the Packers game last night and you don't want to have to keep hitting refresh on the uh, the web page you want the score to update live at least live ish whenever the data changed so ajax allows a certain aspect of a page to update without the entire page refreshing <coughs> then jquery came out what did jquery do it did the same thing but better it gave you a more um, a modular way of kind of walking through the hierarchy of a web page because in web pages um, JavaScript, JavaScript represents the web pages inside of a variable called the document. So you actually have an object that represents the current web page and you can walk through that thing. In Ajax, you had to be, you know, kind of meticulous. You know, you had to walk through. It wasn't as easy to walk through, but you did have access to everything. jQuery kind of gives you a, a, a paint by number for how to get to certain aspects uh, of the page. Okay. But what's funny is you have these two technologies I just mentioned, and both of them are just JavaScript libraries. There's nothing special about them. Just somebody wrote a library in JavaScript that allows you to do some stuff related to a web page that you could have done before. You could have written that stuff yourself years and years and years before. But now somebody came out with a, uh, a library that makes it easy for you. So you can just use it. Okay. Agile, or not agile, sorry, Angular, React. These are some other. JavaScript technologies um, that solve kind of a, a similar problem. They allow there to be kind of a, a almost a client server on the front end side for your, your web pages. But they're kind of Ajax and uh, uh, jQuery on steroids, let's say. Now, so the point I'm getting at here is all of these things are just JavaScript. They have all these crazy names, but they're actually just JavaScript libraries, every single one of them. Now, Node.js, when it came out, um, it really had, did anybody want to take a guess at what the motivation between Node.js is? You know, what, what, why did, why did Node.js come out? First of all, it has JS on it, so probably related to JavaScript, right? Is it like a, like an addition? Like, uh, well, I mean, so all these things are additions like that, but... When a new technology comes out, decisions are made um, that, uh, you know, maybe have an impact on the technology. And specifically with Node.js, they decided that, um, well, here, I'll give you a hint. 
Node.js is actually a server side technology, not a client side technology. All right, so client side being in the web browser, server side being on the web server someplace else. Yet the language you write it in is JavaScript. So you're doing your server side scripting in JavaScript. What would the motivation behind that be? Condense all into one place. You're only having to write all these different languages and kind of connect them together. You're just using JavaScript. Yep. And, and so that, that's a true statement. But, and, but the motivation it lays on top of that is, Typically, who's doing the front end development? Kind of more graphic designer people, um, and they dabble in, you know, they, they, they're, we wouldn't, maybe from a computer science perspective, we wouldn't call them um, full fledged programmers. They use JavaScript as a tool to do website type logic, right? Now, does that mean that all web programmers are non programmers? Does it mean they're effectively artists who do a, who dabble in form ver ver verification? Or are some web designers full-fledged programmers? Absolutely, right? They might have that skill. All right. So now they might want to get into back-end programming. Well, what's that? So if they're front-end, they're doing what shows up on the browser and form validation stuff. The back-end side of things might be like the authentication. Username and password gets sent to the server. You take the username and password. You authenticate it against a database or whatever. And now you send the signal back saying that everything's good. Now, if you've been a front end developer for a long, long, long time, and now all of a sudden you want and you feel like your, your programming is kind of in your skill set, you might want to get into some of the back end stuff. So you're more of a, a one stop shop for some of these things, right? So rather than having to go and learn one of these, uh, um, traditional backend languages like a PHP uh, or a Ruby or something like that, you can now take a language that you're already familiar with, like JavaScript, and write your backend stuff using JavaScript. Make sense? All right, so that's kind of the, the, the high-level motivation between Node.js. But the reason I brought up Node.js here is Node.js really brought one thing to the table that was kind of new. Um, uh, new to the, the web programming thing, and that's something equivalent to Unity's messages. Being able to raise an event when something occurs and you can then respond to that event rather than constantly check for an event. <coughs> and this is actually a pretty important thing in web programming because web programming is somewhat stateless. You know, in uh, uh, Unity, we're, we're, we're fortunate. You know, we kind of have to play this game, pun intended, I guess. We kind of have to play this game of how often do I check for something? Do I do it in fixed update or do I do it in update? And what's the cost of asking a thousand questions inside of update, right? But the point is, is that we're having to answer that question about what the negative cost is, not whether or not we could do it. So in Unity, we could just make it easy. Anytime we want to know whether something's occurred, we could just ask about it in update. That's a once per frame thing and just say, look, can't run my game, get a better computer. <laughs> That's kind of the, the punchline, right? Now, as a good game designer, we should probably take some of these things into consideration, but Unity has a really simple uh, approach to uh, giving you an opportunity to ask questions on a once per frame basis, which is as good as you're going to get, right? Okay. Well, something like a website doesn't do that. We don't have this idea of a frame rate with a website. Once your page is displayed in the web browser, that's all she wrote, right? It's there. You don't have that update that like, oh, can you, did something happen? Did something happen? Did something happen? Node.js gave us the ability to respond to an event and then rewrite part of the web page through a previous technology like an Ajax or a jQuery or uh, an Angular or something like that. Make some sense? Okay, so it's leveraging an existing technologies to have a certain part of the website get rewritten, but it's allowing us to have a, um, a stateless server on the server side where we get notified when something has actually occurred and that then fires and allows us to talk to the web page that we have this uh, connection with through like an Angular or React. Angular is Google's uh, technology. React is Facebook's competitor. Uh, to it. Those are our two kind of new kids for 
front end slash loose server connection. And then you throw a Node.js on there, you effectively add the ability to write your server side stuff in JavaScript, and then you also um, have the ability to respond to events. Punchline. Make sense? Okay, so that's kind of a real life example of the observer design pattern that isn't necessarily important for this class, but seeing it in the context of the grander field of computer science, I thought was worthwhile kind of talking about. Make sense? Um, so I won't ask you on a test about Node.js, but just to see that this isn't some special Unity thing. This is something that is part of computer science problem solving. Okay, so the observer design pattern says, look, you should be as productive as possible while you're waiting for some event to occur. And then as soon as the event occurs, we'll let you know. And then you can respond to it then. Make sense? Unity implements this through something called messages. All right, we'll bump into it at some point in the future. I think maybe the third game uses messages. Uh, otherwise, I'll force it in somewhere <laughs> and we'll, we'll look at it. But uh, effectively, instead of you having to ask the question inside of update constantly, uh, it can say, look, I'm going to let you know. And in this case, maybe I'm going to let you know that there was a collision because that's what it was um, alluding to here. Right. On controller collide hit. So rather than you having to check inside of update, did the controller hit something, the controller hit something, the controller hit something, and then even further, the controller hit the top, did the controller hit the bottom, the controller hit the side, you know, all sorts of things like that. We can say, when, go ahead and let me know when the controller hits something. <clears throat> and notice this gives us a controller collider hit. And in a controller collider hit, I guarantee, well, I, yeah, I'm going to guarantee that it's going to allow us to ask where did it hit. So let's look at a controller collider hit thing here. And this should allow us to dig into yeah, the impact point. Um, although that's a little different than what I was expecting there. Controller that hit the collider. Yeah. So it'll send the message, the hit thing will allow, so the on collider hit will allow us to get a object of type controller collider hit. From that, we can get our actual controller and from our actual controller, we can look at the collider flags. So we can, once somebody lets us know that, look, you, the, the, you bumped into something, now deal with it. Now you could ask, where did I bump into it or something like that? That makes sense? All right, so that has its own overhead, though, associated with it. If you're going to use the message passing uh, uh, aspect here, now you're reliant on somebody else paying attention for a hit. You know, so just, you know, somebody just sitting there watching your uh, controller, and as soon as it hits, it says, oh, hit! And then you can choose whether you want to listen for that or not, and then do something in response. Make sense? So that's that's kind of a, the observer design pattern in... Uh, uh, in real time there. All right, so let me <clears throat> go back here. Oh, okay. Um, all right, so let's see, I had it open in here, didn't I? Skip new version. All right, I think what I have here is the fully, fully running game. Yeah, I have the fully running game here. So there's aspects of this you haven't done yet. Um, but I just thought this would be the path of least resistance to get into um, some of the scripts. So I'm going to go to player script here. And we're going to go to player move because that's what we're kind of focusing on here. <coughs> and I'm going to look at some of the aspects of this guy and talk about them. <laughs> I need coffee. All right, so here's our character controller here, and here's our collision flags. And we start off our collision flags at none, just so we can use that for, for doing some things. Um, 
Uh, we'll look at the animator here in a second. Actually, um, yeah, uh, well, let me look at the animator here real quick. Um, so the animator, which we have not done anything with animation yet in terms of me discussing it in class, uses something called a state machine. So an animator is effectively a state machine that allows Boolean expressions to dictate when a transition between one state and another should occur. All right. <clears throat> now, you're in 490, right? Yeah. Okay. So have you guys done uh, uh, finite state automatas yet? Okay. So one thing you'll do, so this idea of a state machine, not a unity thing. So again, I always want to keep saying, you know, this is more of Dr. Locklear's grand ideas in computer science. Well, it's not a him thing, but he focuses on that. This is more of a truth thing, right? So grand ideas of computer science. There's aspects of computer science, aspects of each of these things found in all of these courses. We can talk about this stuff from all sorts of different angles. We care about it from one angle in here, but this idea of having a state machine, uh, idea of having maybe the, the final state of something, these are all things that transcend game programming and belong in all sorts of other classes. Classes. So I'm talking about it in the state machine in here. Now, I've mentioned this idea of a Boolean expression. What's a Boolean expression? True or false. True or false. Any expression that boils down to a single value of true or false. So we're going to have the ability to have Boolean expressions associated with our states. We're going to have the ability to ask a question. Has something occurred? If something has occurred, we might transition from one state to another state. Make sense? And that allows our guy to look like he's running versus standing there versus jumping versus swinging, all sorts of different stuff. These various animation things. All right. So I'm just going to go ahead and open up the animator here. And I'm going to. I'm going to do some stuff. Let's see. Can I? Well, here, if I drag him out of there. Ooh, no, it's not going to look. As good as I want it to look. Ah, I can do this. Ah, whatever. There's probably a way to get me to get more of it on the screen than that. It's who? Middle mouse. Oh, the middle mouse button? Oh, I don't got that one. <laughs> I'm doing the scroll thing, so I got the equivalent of that, but uh, I can't get it actually bumped over here. Ah, there we go. I have to go out and zoom in a different place. <laughs> Um, all right, so when we enter this state machine, we have our entry point here. Um, now, notice that we have this extra little dude up here called any state. So from any of these states, any state we might have here, we can have a transition. So this guy right here says, if death is true, this is the Boolean expression associated with that transition, if death is true, then you should die. This is what that guy says. Play that animation uh, if uh, the flag death has uh, gets set to true. Now, notice over here on the left, we have parameters. So these are kind of like function inputs, right? So there's we have three different parameters here. We have a walk, we have an attack, and we have a death. Death is a Boolean. So if I hit the little plus sign here, like I'm adding another parameter, I can add a float, an int, a Boolean, or something called a trigger. Um, and these guys are doing it. This is a float. Attack is an int. Um, uh, so they're not doing any triggers here, but uh, uh, we'll use triggers uh, fairly often, actually, in game programming. Uh, these are allowing us to have a um, kind of a threshold value. So if I click on, so if I'm standing and uh, let's see, does it have any walking stuff here? Uh, 
I would have expected there to be a... So this is more of the attack animator. So let me go back here. Inside animator? Oh, I got you. There's a, there's a thing inside of here. Yeah, so this, uh, the blend tree allows us to go between um, kind of an idle and a run, and it does the, 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 the matching in between it to transition um, into that. All right, but unimportant for what I'm trying to get at here. So let's see, can I go back? All right, so from stand, if we uh, say attack one, we'll transition to that guy, so on and so forth. And then we can finish an attack. So if I'm in attack one and I go back, um, when this guy finishes, it will actually automatically go back on this one. It goes back to stand just when he completes. So here's his uh, transition thing here. So actually that is set up. That's part of the blend tree thing here for the take. All right, so we would call this guy a state machine. From any individual state, we have transitions. Those transitions go to other states when something has occurred. All right, so in this case, we go from stand to attack one when the attack parameter is set to a one and it's equal to one make sense so that's what this guy is so our animations are governed by a state machine where each of these dudes is actually one of our animations that we want to play all right so an animation is already pre-rendered we just have to decide when it's going to play and one of the things that they do in the movement script is they try to make it uh um, look natural so he has some logic in there to make it look natural so that when you are transitioning between running and attacking you kind of finish your last step of a run before you start swinging that way you're not having two animations having one animation getting interrupted in the middle and then having another animation stop unless that made sense for the animations you're working with so you do have kind of that granular uh, control so going back over here to the logic, so, you know, they have uh, um, some different stuff set up here. We have our move speed. Um, uh, we can say whether or not we can move. So we're from the middle of an attack. We could turn off uh, can move so we can let that animation finish playing, that kind of stuff. Uh, we can let ourselves know when movement has finished. We're keeping track of where we're, where our target is and uh, whether or not we're well the this would probably be the direction in which we're moving um, for the the uh, character controller. <clears throat> All right, so on awake we grab our animator. We also grab our character controller, so we have access to those two variables, right? All right. Um, Calculate height. What's he doing in there? Oh, he's asking if we're uh, grounded or not. So this has to do with how far we are off the ground. And as we're falling, this will tell us. Um, uh, calculate height. Does this get called inside of update? Yeah, it does. So if we are going from some height down, uh, this guy gets called on update. And it'll allow us to finally hit the ground. Calculating when we hit the ground for whether or not height should be equal to zero. So this will have our countdown for height off the ground. All right. <clears throat> is grounded. This is using an inline if statement here. Uh, have we seen this before in, in this class? All right, so this is an inline if statement. This is the Boolean expression. So if that is true, Then, boy, actually, this is funny. Why is it? That's a really stupid. Collision. <coughs> Flags dot. No, you spell it wrong. Oh, 
I'm just being stupid. No, I'm still not being stupid. This is dumb code. Here's the Boolean expression before the question mark here. So if this is true, return true. If this is false, return false. Why don't we just return this? It doesn't make any sense to me. Um, I mean, sometimes in like a beginning programming class, I'll teach it. Well, I probably wouldn't teach it as a inline if statement. I would probably do something more like this. If this Boolean expression If we're going to be super obvious here, if that guy is equal to true, then return true. Else return false. All right. So I'm asking the question, if this Boolean expression boils down to true, return true otherwise return false i might as well just return this boolean expression that would be you know more of a, a, a normal programmer's approach to it so i'm not sure why he went through this effort of having like this fancy inline if statement that we could have just returned this and been done with it but whatever i can't imagine how it would be different Yeah, I mean, when I went through the videos before, I remember there were some times where he would say things that didn't make a lot of, you know, that that's just the way he's always done it. And maybe didn't didn't make a whole lot of sense. I don't know. I'll leave it. But to me, this is, you know, not the, the greatest programming. You could just return that and move on with life because this logic says the same thing. <clears throat> so that's our is grounded, but what I'm more interested in here is this guy right here. <coughs> the move the player. All right, so this is where we're getting our mouse button, right? So we've clicked somewhere on the screen. So when we've clicked on the screen, this is where we're going to get our ray. So we're asking the main camera to get us a screen point to array. So wherever we clicked on the screen, we're now creating a ray off of that point. So this is what we talked about a while ago today, right? All right. And now this is where things get a little interesting. So we're going to actually use the physics engine to ray cast. What are we ray casting? We're ray casting this ray. And then notice we have this thing here called a ray cast hit, called hit. Now, when I, so this guy's a function. Raycast function takes in two parameters. It takes in the ray, and it takes in a raycast hit. Why do we have this word out in front of it? And I'm going to connect this to something else we talk about in 200 and 250. Anybody know what the purpose of out is? Okay, so no, he doesn't know. He outputs that value or that value to variable hit. Okay, um, uh, even even that's not quite quite there. So I'm definitely passing hit in. So let me go back here. Let me give you a little hint. <clears throat> variable passing pass by reference versus pass by value remember this from 200 all right when something is passed by reference changes 
to the value have side effect. When something is passed by value, changes to the value have no side effect. That means if you change the variable in there, that change is not permanent. Make sense? Now, some information here, and this is kind of an interesting C sharp a Java transition to, well, C to Java, then back to C sharp. <coughs> when we went from C to Java, one of the features we lost was structs. Okay, the struct data type. When we brought in C sharp, they brought structs back. And so one thing we can say here is that structs, objects are passed by reference, correct? So if I pass in an object into a, uh, uh, into a function and we change the contents of that object, those changes will be permanent. They are passed by reference, passed by address. Structs, just like primitive types, are passed by value. So what's actually happening here in my last minute is hit, this guy right here, is a struct. By, def, by default, he's being passed in by value. So that means any change that occurs in here does not permanently change hit. Me throwing the word out in front of it, the keyword out, I'm saying, I want to force this guy to be passed by reference, which means that when hit gets changed inside of the raycast function, I want that change to be, I mean, it's not just going to change hit, but I want to get that value back out. I want, I'm passing hit in by reference rather than by value so that I can view the changes that were made to it inside that function. Make sense? So saying out here has less to do with the output. It has more to do with how this input is treated. So I'm saying I care about the value of this guy afterwards. So force him to be passed by reference. Forcing him to be passed by reference will then mean when this guy is done, I can then ask questions about hit and I will be able to recognize the things that changed inside of Raycast related to hit because I forced him to be passed by reference, passed by address. That makes sense? So that's what that out keyword is for. All right. Um, so let's actually stop because uh, we're done at 920, right? So let's stop right there. Um, remember, fall break starts at what, 4 p.m. tomorrow? Is that right? Yeah, so if you have classes earlier in the day tomorrow, you have those classes. Um, classes that meet after 4 p.m. tomorrow don't meet uh, unless they're a grad class and your teacher has made other arrangements with you. Um, in any case, the next time I'll see you is a week from today. Uh, no homework over break. We'll come back on Tuesday. We'll talk about the, uh, uh, the midterm that we'll have on Thursday, and we'll finish talking about some of this stuff to get the theory behind the stuff you've been working on kind of meshed together. Sound good? Questions, comments, concerns, bribes? You're invited to join me in the front row of chapel. Lots and lots of room up there. Also remember today is student faculty staff Bible study. God and Grub uh, starts at noon to one in the terrace room. Just show up to the cafeteria, sign in, get your tray, and take it down there. I'll save you a seat.